what they hear, negative visuals they see, platforms that you give seem like all there is to be. Media betrays teens as a life not to live. It's a negative. Shocked out without a glimpse of us shall be And on the contrary full of life and style Stay tuned and you'll see Rabbi Mark Snyder he is an international figure who is known for his innovative leadership in the promotion of dialogue and cooperation in the intergroup and race relations as a prominent leader of the Jewish community. Rabbi Mark Snyder has emerged in the forefront of combating anti-Semitism and Islamophobia in the Jewish and Muslim communities around the world. He serves as Vice President of the World Jewish Congress, Honorary Chairman of the World Jewish Congress United States, and spearheads its commission on intergroup relations. Founder and president of the Foundation of Ethnic Understanding of which Russell Simmons is chairman. He is the founding rabbi of the Hampton Synagogue in West Hampton Beach and the New York Synagogue in Manhattan. He has been honored by the United States Congress and the State of Israel as an advocate for human and civil rights and religious and ethnic tolerance. In 2009, Rabbi Mark Snyder was inducted into the Martin Luther King Jr. Board of Preachers at Morehouse College in Atlanta. Let's take a look at the presentation Rabbi Mark Snyder made last Wednesday at our mentoring session. So I'm here to give you a um, more of a unique perspective on the life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and to really focus on what I find to be his greatest quality and his most important legacy. You see, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. understood that a people who fight for their own rights are only as honorable as when they fight for the rights of all people. So you remember Dr. King as being that great civil rights leader and advocate on behalf of the African American community. I, as an American Jew, I celebrate Dr. King's life not only for what he did for the African American community, but what he did for others and particularly what he did for the Jewish community as well. I want you to remember that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr the great leader, the prophetic voice of the civil rights movement was an advocate for all. Hey TLT, my name is Peace and I've got a spoken word piece to share with the rest of y'all so I hope you enjoy it. There is a man I look to when the sun shines and the rain drops. There is a man I look to in the middle of a winter scenery. I'm talking when it's just me and nobody around me. My friends are imaginary. Because at this point, I'm starting to see a bit more of me. A bit more than me than what I used to see. I used to always see a girl that was so kind, always getting things and smiling because I guess she deserved it. Every time that she would earn things, she was like, well, I, I worked for it. And I would always smile about my gifts, smile about them, high five the people, shake their hands and walk away. But that was it. Never once thought about returning half of it just half of it, not even a full profit. I don't even try to gain nothing. I just wanted to have all of it. I didn't think about sharing or returning. So when I saw poverty, I looked at it, smiled, kicked some dirt, and kept walking. I didn't believe in sharing or even giving my thoughts. And I thought, ha, penny for your thought, well, I'd rather save mine, keep them. They add up to dimes. And dimes add up to quarters, would add up to half dollars, and then I have a dollar. And $10 is $100, and $100 to 1000 So why should I give a penny for your thoughts? But there was a man who boggled my thoughts. This man stood up for what he thought was right, regardless of what it cost. And it cost more than just a dollar, more than just a dime, more than 10, more than a couple of rhymes. It cost more than applauses and more than some tears. It cost a bullet going through him right here. It cost his life. So his last inhale, exhale was like, and that was it. 
and he knew what it would cost, but he said, let me tell you something, I've got a dream. And this dream is not about what I will receive, but what we will begin to believe when it's more than just one colored man and an Asian girl standing hand in hand. We talk in unity. We talk in different kind of colors, blending so that you can see all the shades of gray. We're talking beauty, beauty in all its dimensions. So it's not just you or me or her or him. And it's no longer judgment between what we were or what we used to be, but now it's all that we could be. So let's talk about giving. I want to talk about generosity, about this man who stood up for mankind, womankind, and all of humanity. This guy believed in a bit of giving, just a bit of giving, and just a bit of love, and just a bit of hope, blessing, and luck. So now we can smile, hold hands together, and jump, because for once we can start to see what it means to truly give. Thank you. Hi, Rabbi. I'm Adrian Velasquez. I'm 17. And, you know, I admire you because, you know, you're really successful and stuff. And I didn't know who you was until you walked through. You know, I watched your show on the Dayspot Network, The Jewish Jesus. I really like it. All right, but my question is, um, as a successful man, you know, I understand you go through a lot of scrutiny, especially because of your ideals and your morals and the things you believe in. So I just want to know, how well do you take criticism and, you know, how do you receive scrutiny and, you know, stuff like that? I don't... Uh shy away from criticism. It could be um, maybe someone didn't like my sermon or I could have uh, made a better presentation. You know, I'm always willing to learn. But I have to know that the criticism is coming from a good place and from a genuine place. You know, as, as I've matured in life, I now surround myself with friends who tell me the things that I don't necessarily want to hear. I used to have the friends who told me everything I want to hear. Now I have friends who tell me things I don't necessarily want to hear. But I always know that whatever they say, it's coming from a good place. Good evening, Rabbi. Uh, thank you for the speech and uh, on anti-Semitism and the Jewish involvement in the civil rights movement. So thank you for that. And. Um, First, I want, my name is Najee. I go to, I'm 16 year old, and I go to Harry S. Truman in the Bronx. And I would like to ask you, there's a thousand cities, millions of people. Why here tonight? Why in this room? Why are you, why are you here? Why am I here? Yes. Okay, that's a fair question. <laughs> Very fair question. Um, I think first, Michelle, um, had shared with me all the wonderful work that's being done here. Uh, second, I was very intrigued about coming up to the South Bronx. And thirdly, I just had a good feeling. It was just my gut. Um, and I'm glad I made the choice. Greetings, my name is Shantija Pepper. I'm a singer for TLT, and today I'm going to give you some vocal tips on singing from your diaphragm, singing in full voice. What singing in full voice really means is, like I said, singing from your diaphragm, which is having great breath support. So when you sing like this, like when you sing like how I'm going to sing from your throat, uh, that's okay, but if you want to sound more fuller, you take a, deep, a big deep breath from your bottom, from your diaphragm, which is right here, like as if, you know, like you're blowing in air out, you're blowing air out. You, feel you can use your hand to see if you're blowing air out from your stomach, not from your lungs. Your shoulders shouldn't be up, they should be down. And it, it should sound like this. Um, I hope you enjoyed those tips. If you want any more tips, comment down to me on TMS. And see you next time. All right, let's give a hand for our in-house guest today, Rabbi Mark Snyder. It's a pleasure having you on the show today. Um, I think we've learned something today. It's, I know it's our first time having a rabbi here at TLT Squared Show, and it's probably your first time actually coming to the South Bronx, definitely conversing with a bunch of teenagers. And I think we've learned that all our teens aren't, you know, hood-wearing, you know, gun-toting, violent, ignorant folk but we also are people who are very intelligent, law-abiding citizens with something positive to offer society. 
and we show that today as we converse on the show. Um, well, we want to leave you with a positive song, and this song is called I Remember You. And this song goes out to all of our fallen soldiers, but it also goes out to all of our great leaders who have passed away. But I also want to send this song out to all of us who may have lost loved ones, you know, brothers, sisters, you know, um, due to gang violence, stray bullets. Um, the legacy lingers on. They're never forgotten. And so this song goes out to them and to you. And the song is called I Remember You. Anybody here seen my old friend Malcolm? And can you tell me where he's gone? He's helped a lot of people. It seems a good time. And I looked around and he was gone. Anybody here seen my old friend Rosa? And can you tell me where he's gone? He's helped a lot. Jr. had to say about the state of Israel. I quote, I think it is necessary to say 
that what is basic and what is needed in the Middle East is peace. Peace for Israel means security. And we must stand with all of our might to protect Israel's right to exist, its territorial integrity. And he continues, I see Israel as one of the great outposts of democracy in the world and a marvelous example of what can be done. How desert land can be transformed into an oasis of brotherhood and democracy. Peace for Israel means security, and that security must be a reality. So here is Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. championing, fighting, and advocating for the state of Israel, which, as you know, is at the very core of what it means to be Jewish. An example of Dr. King, again, being the advocate for others as well. Listen to what Dr. King had to say about the Holocaust. Remember the Holocaust? took place in Europe, first in Germany, and Hitler came to power in 1933. And that's when he had created what's known as the Nuremberg Laws, where uh, Jews had to wear the yellow star, could no longer attend uh, schools, universities. So listen to what King had to say. Perhaps, if there had been a broader understanding of the uses of nonviolent direct action in Germany, as we do in the south of the United States, when Hitler was rising and consolidating his power, the brutal extermination of six million Jews would have been averted. Listen to how powerful this statement is now. King says, if Protestants and Catholics had made the oppression of the Jew their very own oppression, had Protestants and Catholics come into the streets beside the Jew to scrub the sidewalks, had they worn the yellow armbands by the millions, a unique form of mass resistance to the Nazis would have developed. And what Martin Luther King Jr. W was advocating, the importance of making the other's oppression your oppression. And I just came across a remarkable statistic concerning the Freedom Riders in 1963, 1964, that more than 60% of the Freedom Riders from the North were Jews, while the Jewish community was only 2% of the American population. Hi, Rabbi. My name is Melissa. I'm 17 years old, and I go to the Academy of Masi Ursula. My question for you is, as a spiritual leader and a revolutionary, how do you suggest, what advice do you give a teen who wants to make change in, in the future or wants to be successful? My first suggestion would be always follow your heart and to enter a field or to engage in a project that you're passionate about. Very important. Or else you, you, you just won't succeed. Um, I can tell you when I first began in black Jewish relations, now let's understand that things were great up to Dr. King's assassination. And then relations between blacks and Jews really went south. And probably the lowest point in black Jewish relations 
were the Crown Heights riots in 1991. I don't know if you're familiar with what took place there. But things were really at a very, very, very difficult place for a host of reasons. I remember when I first entered into this field, there were colleagues of mine, there were members of the Jewish community, they, they, they would vilify me. You know, they, they'd call me the white Sharpton, which they did not mean as a compliment back then. Uh, today, you know, Sharpton and I always joke about it. In fact, tomorrow night, I guarantee you, he will introduce me, you know, to his whole entourage there and say, and now for the white Sharpton, you know, <laughs> Rabbi Mark Schneier. Um, but today, you know, and, and I give my partner, Russell Simmons, Tremendous, tremendous, tremendous credit for this. I mean, Russell, I have to tell you that we have a belief in Judaism that when God measures a human being, that he doesn't put or place a tape around the head, but around the heart. Because the heart is the truest index of a person's humanity. I'm telling you, there isn't a tape long enough to measure the heart of Russell Simmons. I mean, he's just a very, and, and I know all, you know, I know P. Diddy. I mean, really, if you ask Jay-Z, P. Diddy, go ask Beyonce. Don't even mention my name. Just ask him, who's your rabbi? If you ever see them, just ask them. All right? Just ask them. But I'm always embarrassing Russell. We went to Israel together in June. So it must have been last January, we were planning the trip. And he says something about ludicrous. I said, what's so ludicrous about going to Israel? You know, he says, you know, he says, Mark, you know, you're just, you know, you know, and, and it took me a while to remember, you know, Kanye West, like, you know, think West, not East, you know, West, 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 West. <laughs> so he has very much expanded my horizons here. Um, so Russell wrote me the most beautiful note over Christmas New Year's. You know, he's really having a rough time down St. Bart's. You probably all read about what he was doing on page six every day. And, uh, you know, I'm having bike accidents, you know, down Florida. And he, he just wrote me a note before New Year's. He said, you know, of all of my involvements, all my charitable in involvements, and all my philanthropy, and all my organizational involvements in my career, in my life, nothing, nothing, has been more meaningful to me than the work that you and I do together. And it's because it's also his passion. Russell, Sim Russell, at the end of the day, he's a yogi. So Russell wants everyone to love each other. Er he wants everyone you know, to hold hands. If it was up to Russell Simmons, we would change the name, not the Foundation for Ethnic Understanding, but the Foundation for Ethnic Harmony. Right? He thinks we should all be alike. Now, I don't necessarily agree with that. I, don't, I think it's impossible to be alike. I think we can still understand one another. I think that's a little more realistic. But that's Russell. But whether it's Russell, myself, and others, if you want to succeed, follow your heart and, and embrace that. And, and that will really take you to the promised land. Thank you, Rabbi. My pleasure. Hello, good evening. Um, my name is Joseph Castro. I am 15 years old and I attend Talent Unlimited High School. And my question for you is, what did the civil rights movement mean to the Jewish people? The civil rights movement was a wake up call to the Jewish people. Uh, there's probably no other people outside of the African-American community here in the States that understands the pain of persecution and oppression. For 2,000 years since our exile from the land of Israel, we experience the oppression, the coercion, the subjugation, the crusades, the inquisition, the pogroms, the holocaust. You know, I can go on and on and on. And therefore, we've always had this tremendous empathy for others who suffer persecution, and we feel a sense of responsibility to fight that fight. 
Now, I used to believe that the most important commandment in the Bible, there are 613 commandments, was, and, and I'm sure we've all been taught this, right? Love thy neighbor as thyself, right? I was wrong. I believe the most important commandment in the Bible is to love the stranger. You see, love thy neighbor is mentioned only once. Love the stranger is mentioned 36 times. And it's really not any great challenge to love thy neighbor. So who is your neighbor? Your neighbor is probably someone who lives, of course, lives in your community. Probably is of the same uh, ethnic or racial background. Your children probably go to the same school. Big deal. Love thy neighbor. The real challenge is to love the stranger. The stranger who doesn't look like you. The stranger who has, comes from a different culture. The stranger who comes from a different ethnicity. The stranger may come from a different religious background. That's the challenge. And it's interesting how in the Bible, love the stranger that commandment, that injunction, we find 36 times. And this is very much at the core of Jewish existence and why we have always been, um, why we, we have always responded in a disproportionate matter, a manner to other communities. I mentioned before, freedom writers, I mean, it's unbelievable. 60% of the Freedom Riders are Jews, while the Jewish community made up only 2% of, of the American population. But at the same time, I'm not surprised. That has always been uh, our mantra. Uh, that has always been our way of thinking. And uh, I know that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the leadership of the Civil Rights Movement at the time were very, very appreciative. You know that the NAACP was founded 102 years ago by Jews. Not by African Americans, by Jews. 